All right. Nice to get a, an applause before we speak, actually. Yeah. That's good. That's good. So welcome to this talk about cracking the code to secure software. Uh, really happy to see that so many of you are actually interested in this, even though there are going a lot of good talks in parallel with this. Yes. All right. So before we jump into the nitty-gritty stuff, uh, who are you, Daniel? Well, my name is Daniel Sawano. I work at a company called Avanza Bank based here in Stockholm. Uh, we're basically an internet-based stockbroker and bank. And to give you an idea how our size, we're the biggest uh, actor on the Stockholm Stock Exchange in terms of trades. And who are you, Daniel? Well, my name is Daniel Deogan. I'm from Omega Point, a consultancy firm here in Stockholm, uh, in Gothenburg, Malmö, exactly all of Sweden. Uh, specialized in application development and security, uh, as it turns out. Um, well, that's kind of boring. So yeah, just if you want Google this in yeah. case you're interested. Go to Google. Uh, yes. So, you know, the title is like a clickbait, right? But yes. What's, what's cracking the code all about? Well, cracking the code is actually part of a bigger concept called secure by design. And secure by design, that's a mindset that allows you to focus on good design practices and basically get security for free. Okay, so wait a minute. So you're saying that you want to build a secure system by not thinking about security? Yeah. Or, or at least not explicitly thinking about it all the time. Exactly. Isn't that great? I mean, what if you could, you know, admit it? I mean, every developer hates security, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but if you could focus on, you know, building good software and suddenly that software becomes secure, that would be, you know, almost like magic. Yeah, and our experience is that it tends to work very well because we developers love to build great software. We want to be resilient and scalable and everything. We like to create something beautiful. It's our little baby sometimes. So it's a lot easier to focus and think about or adapt or adopt um, good design practices rather than thinking, oh, I'm going to think about this cross-site scripting thing, this injecting thing. So, so it's a lot easier to, to grasp those concepts. And if we can find a couple of design patterns and ideas, uh, that will help you promote the security of your system, then that's great. Right. And that's pretty much what this talk is about. So, what will we cover today? Well, first of all, if this turns out to be true, at least we should try to find a real, I guess, security problem and see if we can you know, fix that problem by using, I guess, a good design practice that doesn't focus on security, right? Yeah. And then this says something like immutable mutability. It sounds like a paradox. Yeah, it sounds like a mind twist. But basically, we're going to look at some of the issues that comes with mutable state or shared mutable states in terms of security and how we can kind of mitigate that, or reduce that risk by using a couple of design ideas. And then at the end, we'll, we'll uh, go on and see how we can prevent or help detect, rather, leakage of sensitive data, accidental leakage. And I guess that's a... Pretty common topic nowadays when GDPR is sort of kicking in, right? Yeah. So that's pretty good. A couple of months. All right. So I guess it's time for the first classical example, right? Okay. How many have not heard of cross-site scripting? Oh, everybody knows it. Not a single hand. But if okay. you who, who didn't raise your hand, uh, we'll just do a fast recap. Basically, this is a cross-site scripting 101. We have a web form where you're supposed to enter a phone number. And right. then Mr. Evil Hacker comes and enters something else. Uh, let's say a script tag. And that doesn't need to be, a, I guess, a, a pop-up alert box, right? It can yeah. be something really evil, like a keylogger or something. Exactly. Okay. So, so what's the cross-site scripting? What's actually the tag thing here? So for example, let's say you entered that. Mm -hmm. and the data, the script tag that you entered goes into the system, gets stored in some kind of persistence, a database, for example. And then at some later point, you read that data up and you display it on a web page. And if you're unlucky, the browser is going to actually interpret that script tag as an actual tag and it's going to execute the JavaScript in there, doing something evil or in this case, just showing a pop-up. But Daniel, I mean, this gets stored in the database. I'm not using a database, so I'm safe, right? Um, not really. There's variants of these. Okay. So there's one thing called reflective cross-site scripting, which is basically okay, you've been pretty good, you're actually validating your input. You're saying, huh, I'm going to throw an exception. And you throw the exception, um, you're a little bit unlucky. So for some reason, that stack trace, or you include the input in the message in the exception, and it will be displayed in the browser. And again, if you're unlucky, that browser can actually start to execute the script. 
That's a reflective cross-site scripting. So you're saying that it's never, ever a good idea to echo input ad verbatim? No, never do that. Okay, the good design practice, don't do it. Okay, but these are the vanilla parts, right? I mean, reflective and stored, those are kind of boring. Yeah, there's something more interesting called second order cross-site scripting. Uh, so what's that about? Okay, as you see here, we sort of have the same principle of injecting you know, some script data, but our primary focus isn't to attack the primary system, but rather the secondary one, right? Yeah. So as an example, let's say you're entering the bad input in one service, the web service, but you don't, you're not really interested in that. For some reason, that service might log that data. Maybe it catches an error or just logs everything because it's fun. And then some, in some other part of your company, there's this admin person looking at log files in some kind of web app, for example. And then that browser, looking at the logs, will start executing the script. Right, so you, you're not attacking the primary system, but rather a secondary system. So, so wait a minute, are we saying that by exploiting some vulnerability in the log reader tool, we're able to get something to execute inside of the trust boundary without us knowing? Exactly, you passed the, the firewalls, the, the great wall of, of China, you passed that, and now you're taking something Probably an admin person had a lot of access to this. So it's really good to get like a, a key logger on that system. Okay, yeah, so, so, so that's bad. So the technical analysis, as you all know, most likely, is that phone number in this case isn't, you know, escaped properly. So I guess yeah, you just when escape we're it. Exactly, when you display the page, you should HTML escape it and you're safe. I and mean, yes, that's true, you solved it. But we're going to come back to this example after we talked a little about, about design and see if we can apply a design pattern to also mitigate this type of vulnerability. And that's without actually thinking about cross-site scripting. Exactly. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. So let's bring up this case then. Buying minus one books. Yeah, this is really cool. This is actually based on a true uh, case study or a true case. Uh, the, the, it wasn't, there is an internet-based... Uh, web shop. They don't sell books, they sell something, but it's an international business. And you could, you know, put books in your shopping cart and buy them, but after a while, some users or customers figured out that, you know, if you post, you, you post in the quantity and, and the ISBN of the book you want to buy, and if you post in like a minus one as quantity, you actually had minus one Hamlet in your shopping cart. So what happened then? Well, when you summed up the total, well, you ended up with a discount. In this case, a pretty good discount of 40 bucks. I mean, isn't that a feature? I mean, it's more reasonable price. Yeah. I mean, I'm still paying. I just thought yeah. it was a little bit too much. Uh, to be honest, what they did is that they did an investigation of how long had this been you know, in that system. And it turned out that customers had used this for a long, long time. Yeah, people were going on forums like, how, you know, hey, how many of you would say that losing money is a security problem? Uh, a few. Oh, pretty good. That's not all hands. Oh. Oh, okay, let me give another example. I walk into a bank, okay? I wave my hands like this, and then I suddenly walk out the door with a lot of money. Would that be a security problem? Hmm. So no, same thing here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So <clears throat> let's analyze this now from a more of a conceptual perspective. Yeah. Could that be it? Yeah, so, so why did... How did this bug, because it's a bug, even if it's called security bug, how did mm -hmm. this bug actually come about? Well, when the developers started coding this, they said, you know, we, gotta, we, have, we need a shopping cart, we've got to buy books, and we need something like a price and a quantity. So what, what's a quantity? It's like um, an integer, probably? Right, I mean, you number. can't buy 1.5 books. No, so it should be an integer. So yeah. just, just put an integer there in our code. Mm -hmm. But what's the problem with having an integer represent a quantity of a book you want to buy? I mean, it's not really a problem. If you look at the math context, it it's, makes perfect sense. Okay. It enters our web shop context. It goes in on the order line. And yeah, that's there. Okay, so what if you start looking at it from a you know, more mathematical point of view? What's, what's an integer actually? What oh, is an integer? Okay, okay. I mean, you're saying that quantity isn't an integer, and if I remember high school math, uh, I guess you all do, um, 
I mean, integer is form an abelian group. It's actually an abelian ring as well, because it's also closed under multiplication. Um, which means that if I pick now, if I pick any two integers, I add them, I'll get another integer in the same set. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And if I have, you know, the identity element is zero. If I add zero to any of my integers, I get the same integer. Okay, I, th I think I probably slipped through math class, but <laughs> what I'm th I think you're saying is that, like, for example, if you take an integer times an integer, you get an integer. Right, right. But That's if I would take like a yes. quantity times a quantity, I would get like quantity square. Okay, so it doesn't really make sense. I'm starting to get this. Quantity is not just an integer, it's something else. And maybe you're not supposed to buy minus 257,000 books. So there's, right. there's like a, I a mean, range that is, uh, has a limit on the quantity. I guess it doesn't make sense to go to shipping and say, I want integer max number of books. That's 2.1 billion something, right? Uh, that doesn't make sense. So, uh, okay, yeah. I might say that quantity looks like an integer, but it doesn't behave like one. Is yeah. that okay? Okay. Okay. So what if we can represent quantity as something else, something different than an integer? Maybe there's even a design pattern that can help us do that. Oh, do you know what? There is one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Weird. Uh, uh, there's something called a domain primitive, all right? And it's basically, if, some of you might be familiar with domain-driven design. There, we have this concept called value object, which is basically a representation of something that is defined by its value. Okay, it's just like a $10 bill. It's just mm -hmm. the 10, number 10 is what's important to me. Okay. I don't care which bill. And a domain primitive is basically like a value object on steroids. We say that not only is it going to have all the properties that the value object have, we're also going to say that it's going to have such a precise and crisp definition that it cannot exist if it's invalid. So you're saying that pure by its mere existence, it means that it's valid. Exactly. Oh. And then, of course, just like a value object, it's immutable, so you can pass it around in your code. You don't have to worry about thread safety and stuff like that. And since it's valid when it cre is created and it's immutable, it's always going to be valid. So and another very important thing is that it represents represents something very important in your current domain, okay, in your current business domain or, you know, whatever technical area you're solving. Dude, this is so abstract. Yeah. I, I really want to see now in code. Okay, so if we take our quantity and we model it as a domain primitive in code, it could look something like this. We basically have a class, we make it final, we make it immutable, and you can put a bunch of domain logic there if you need to do some operations that it has business value. And a very important thing is also, as you can see, we have started to put uh, the domain rules that define the quantity in the constructor. So in this case, we said, well, you can only buy one or up to 99 books, not zero, not minus one, and not 200. So, so this really means that this is not the generic concept of quantity. I guess it could have been book quantity. Would that have been more precise, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it really means that in this particular context, a quantity can only be between 1 and 99. And it's enforced in the constructor, so not only do you know just by having an instance of this object that it's valid, you don't even have to care why it's valid, you just know it's valid. Someone else took care of that. So, okay, so why is this such a huge, big thing? I mean, if, we, if you look at this again for, for our, our uh, conceptual perspective, we can see that now in the math context we have our minus 1. And we try to enter that into our web shop context. And suddenly, it violates our definition of quantity. Yes. So we can't enter minus one. It would be impossible to create that bug, that very specific bug. So in other terms, what that means is that we are somehow successfully ensuring that we only have valid quantities according to our definition. Right. Yeah. Everything else is just rejected. Hmm. So once we start using domain primitives, you'll notice that you know, your, your code, your overall, overall design starts to get tightened up. You, you, it's easier to read. You get fewer bugs and everything. And as, as Daniel pointed out, it's get harder to inject data that is not valid because you kind of reduce the attack vector if you want to use security talk. So, so you could actually inject, I guess, 67 still. Yeah. So if you're able to exploit the system by entering 66 or 67, you could do that, but we 
definitely can't enter a script oh. tag. Oh, wait a minute, you can't enter a script tag. Yeah. So let's try this design pattern of using domain primitives and see how that works on our cross-site scripting example. Yeah. Okay, so we have our web form, right? Uh, we expect normal phone numbers, but Evil Knievel has injected some script. Um, and on the server side, there's some register method, I guess. And uh, the problem is that a string, it accepts anything, right? Yeah. This is you know, very common to see. And as a developer, when I'm coding this, I'm, I tend to look at the variable name. I'll, I see it says phone numbers, so therefore subconsciously or consciously, I know that the phone number is supposed to have this pattern, this many digits, maybe a plus sign and whatever, and therefore it should behave like this and I can do these operations on it. But, but come on, we all know it's phone numbers, yeah, right? But the thing is, an attacker doesn't look at the variable name. She looks at the type, right? It's a string, and a string is like, I don't know, it could be anything, right? So how how worst large can a string be? Pretty large. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's try our new approach and say we have defined a domain primitive phone number. That means that it could be either all the phone numbers in Sweden, or maybe it's in Stockholm, or mobile phone number, the world even could be. But at least it's phone numbers, right? Yeah. So um, that means that we can't put in that script in there. Exactly. So, so now, even if you start to enter bad data, it's not even going to get this far. Right? The input is just going to stop somewhere. Uh, maybe your web framework will take care of it. And as long as you don't spit it out in the logs, as we said earlier, you, you're pretty safe. Okay. And we, we kind of prevented cross site scripting by using a design pattern where we're focused on trying to make our code more precise from a business perspective. We didn't think, oh, how can we stop cross-site scripting? And that's pretty cool. D to be honest, what we have stopped right now is not only cross-site scripting, but a lot of injection flaws. Yeah. Like the minus one books. Also. We, we did not think about the security vulnerabilities. We thought about phone numbers. That's what we're supposed to code. That's what we're supposed to deal with. OK. So, so, again, if you wanted to use security lingo, we mm -hmm. reduced the attack vector. That's essentially what we're doing here. Right. So I guess now, you know, escaping, that's just, you know, we can throw that out, right? Because who needs escaping? Mm, not really. I mean, escaping is still good. You still want to use it. And hopefully you, someone else is doing that via a library. You're not hacking your own web uh, application server. But we still need that because, you know, we, we want to have, think in terms of having multiple barriers to break through, something called you know, security in depth. That's the concept we want. So if we have escaping and good design in terms of domain primitives, we're starting adding security in depth. OK, OK. I guess we can explain it this way too, right? So if we have some treasury inside of a house without any locks or doors, we have a really strong fence around it, right? That's our you know, escape barrier, maybe. Or it could be our firewall, anything like that. Yeah. What happens if you break that fence? Well, then I'm in. I so can, you're home free? Yeah, I can walk into your kitchen and steal your milk. I'm okay, so, so is this security in depth? No, it's okay. just one, one barrier. Ah, okay. So this is really security in depth? Yeah. You, okay. have, you have a good fence, maybe you have good locks, <laughs> you have a dog that you haven't fed in a week, you, yeah. know, you, have, you have an alarm and everything, patrol and guard. So you have multiple barriers, right? So it just makes it so much harder to break in. So even if you that you throw the dog a bone, well, you still have to get through by the alarm, you know? That's secured in depth. And the funny thing is that these kind of systems aren't unbreakable, right? But if you compare it to <laughs> two systems, one is not using it and one is, well, guess what? <laughs> the one that doesn't use it is going to most likely get hacked, whereas the first one won't. So, all right. So we, we say we're going to apply domain primitives yes. to fix these kind of problems, to add security in another layer. But honestly, it becomes so many classes. Yeah, sometimes you don't hear their complaint. Oh, so many classes. But so many files. Yeah, remember we said it represents something very important in your domain. Okay, so if you end up with a lot of domain primitives, can happen. Well, that's just a sign that you actually do have very, a lot of very important concepts in your domain. 
those concept, concepts, it's not going to go away just by ignoring it, letting everything be string or stringly typed. You know, it's just it's going, to be, it's going to be better off to actually represent them explicitly in code. So you're saying that even though I choose to use string, I know it's only going to be valid data. It sort of hides uh, that concept in yeah, there. Yeah, it hides the complexity. Oh, OK, so it's always there. So yeah. complexity is actually going down by using domain primitives? Yeah, I would say so. Because first of all, you have this encapsulation of information, <laughs> so I don't have to worry about what domain rules is actually uh, needed to validate a phone number. I just, I just know it's done once. And also, uh, a domain primitive is immutable, right? So it's thread safe. So I don't have to worry about that. That's one of the, the ugliest things you can write in code, is trying to write concurrent code all over the place because you're in a multi-threaded environment. So you, you remove that complexity, all right? Dude, dude, but creating a lot of objects is expensive, right? Yeah, maybe it used to be. But the thing is, at least my experience, if you're writing, uh, working on a system that has really high demands on maybe low latency or mm -hmm. computing uh, speed and everything, like performance, whatever that is, it tends to be, my experience is, that it tends to be a very small part of that code base that actually has those requirements. So in those requirements, uh, in those parts, if you need to do bit shifting, you know, do bit shifting, don't fly around with a bunch of objects, but then the rest of the code, uh, part of the code, Focus on readability, you know, testability, and functionality instead. Okay, so and as again, as I said, if you rem since you remove all the thread safety issues, that will actually also uh, yeah, increase performance. So I, I guess uh, in ninety nine point nine percent of the cases, this works pretty well. Then yeah. Okay. All right. So if you have Java unsafe anywhere, so that's what you're using. Well, then you know. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So now we've actually seen a case where we can apply a, a design pattern that's used to create better code in terms of domain primitives, right? And that can actually fix some security problems sort of by magic. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. OK. What about this next thing, immutable mutability? That sounds it Sounds weird. cool. But so let's start off by actually trying to understand why immutability or why mutability is a problem for security. And to do that, we're going to use a term or an acronym called CIA. Is that the Trump CIA? No, not the Trump CIA. It's oh. a different CIA, from the, mainly from the information security folks. It stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which are three very important aspects of security. So what's, what's confidentiality about? So, so I, I guess that's very obvious. You're only supposed to reveal data to whoever is authorized to see it. Makes sense, right? Yeah. And integrity, right? That's, you know, make sure that it's never compromised in any way unless it's allowed to be changed, yeah. right? Or the, to make sure a message doesn't change when it's flying over the internet. So yeah. You keep the integrity of the data. But w wait a minute, availability, how can that be a security aspect? Well, it's basically, availability is, as it says, you know, the right data needs to be available when someone wants to access it. That's really the essence. And to, to, I guess to make a real life example, something you can relate to, uh, what, what if your house is on fire? So my, you, yeah. when my house is on fire, I will call 112, right? But mm -hmm. you, you can't get through. So, so someone is doing a lot of prank calls, so the service is not available. And maybe someone is sleeping in there, so people can start dying here. It's, it's, you know, the, the availability suddenly became a pretty serious security issue. And it's the same thing for data. Maybe don't, people don't die all the time because data is not available, even if they can. But the availability of a system or data is really crucial for, for security. So I guess that's the classical uh, I guess agenda or objective for a denial of service attack, right? Yeah. Availability. OK. All right, um, so I guess if, if we combine then, I guess, mutability, which we know it's a problem when it comes to you know, concurrency. Um, Especially when you're talking shared mutable states. Yes. I guess that's the main point. Um, and availability, and putting that together, that, that must be one of the toughest problems that we can deal with, right? Yeah, it is, it is tough that your code becomes complex, very complex, depending on how advanced you want to be. And as we all know, locking is blocking, so as soon as you start fooling around with all these thread locks, you're actually losing availability. So I wonder if there could be a design pattern that addresses this. Hmm. You think? 
what do you know? There okay. is one. <laughs> so let's go back to domain-driven design. We yes. talked about value objects <clears throat> and how you should replace those with uh, domain primitives to make your code more secure. Another big stereotype in domain-driven design is something called an entity. So yes. what's, what's an entity compared to a value object? Mm, compared to a value object, an entity has a unique identifier, right? And it has a lifespan, like a person. Yeah. OK. So well, you would a user, be an entity, maybe. Right? A user, a user, in, user yes, in the user. system. Uh, I guess a user's address could change, uh, age, uh, other personal information. It's still the same user, right? OK, so the data can change over time, mm -hmm. but the identity remains the same. So I guess yes. the identity of the entity is not defined by its, its data. It's maybe assigned, mm -hmm. for example. So let's go back to an example, our favorite one, the order example. And look, we fixed the minus one problem. Yeah. We yes. started to use domain primitives. So now yeah. you can't get discounts anymore. So, so would you say that an order in their business domain, is that something that you know, can change? I would say yes. I mean, you can add stuff, you can remove stuff, maybe it will be paid, maybe it will become shipped. So, you know, it has this life cycle. Okay. But it's still the same order. So I would probably model this as an entity. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Because it has a uniqueness and it has a lifespan and it can change. Yeah. But because it is mutable, when you're writing your code, you have to start thinking about all this stuff. How can I keep the integrity? Okay, I just checked that the order was valid for whatever I'm supposed to do. Maybe someone just touched it two milliseconds ago, and now I have to check it again. So you have this, or maybe should I just put synchronized on the entire object? So you start all these issues that comes with the mutable state that will bring down your availability. All right. OK, so, but there is a remedy for this, of course. And that's called entity snapshots. Yeah. So. Basically, the entity snapshot design idea is based on the understanding that even though you have the concept of an entity in your domain, right, you have this thing that mutates over time, doesn't mean you have to represent it in your code as a mutable object. You can choose to represent it as an immutable object. So you're saying that even though the business says this can change over time, you do not need to implement this as a mutable object in your code you can represent it as an immutable object. Sort of like a domain primitive, right? Yeah, okay. pretty much. Um, the difference, big difference is the identity part, right? Mm -hmm. So the first step in, in do, trying to do this is uh, you want to separate the mutating operations from the, just the reading operations. Okay, so um, it would be something like this, right? Yeah, so for example, you have this read service where you can go to get an order, in this case, represented as an entity snapshot. Or you can have this update service where you go to if you want to start changing the order. So that's sort of like the internet, right? If you access a web page, you go to that server, you get that data to your browser, it gets rendered. It's sort of like a snapshot in time. When your data gets rendered in your browser, it might have changed on the server. Yeah. And of course, it can get pushed and so on later on. But the idea is there, right? We are working on snapshots all the time. Yeah, and on a high level, this is very similar to, <coughs> excuse me, similar to CQRS, like we're separating it. But okay. here we're focusing more on the design part that is about the stuff that is in your domain code. Okay. All right. So how would this look now in code? Yeah. So if we take our order, in this case, in our web shop, and we just implement it as a classic entity, we could have something like this. You have, you have the ID of the order, which defines the order or identifies the order, and yeah, you have a bunch of order items, so you can add items, remove items, maybe do some operations on them. So it's a mutable object. So this is like a regular way of implementing an entity, I guess. Exactly, and what you don't see here is all the junk that has to go in there to make a thread safe. Okay, so if you want to make an entity snapshot. Yeah, so this looks pretty similar, but now you can see we've made this entire object immutable. So you can't add stuff to it, you can't remove things. You can do operations on it as long as it's not mutating. And a very important aspect is we started to put the domain invariance in the constructor, just like we did with the domain primitive. Right? So it starts to behave like the domain primitive. If you're holding an instance of an entity snapshot, you know it's valid in your current domain. So you're saying this could actually be, I mean, those contracts there are kind of simple, but it could be like more advanced stuff, like saying, uh, the number of items cannot be more than this, and the discount code that are apply, exactly. and so on, right? Yeah. Oh, wow, so that, that could be really advanced. So we know that for sure that 
if you get hold of an entity snapshot, it's going to be valid. And it's not going to change while you're doing operations on it. And that's sort of similar to our domain primitive. Very similar. Oh, fantastic. But, but now it represents an entity. I only have one problem with this now. Okay. I need to update it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what you do then? You go to the update service, and then you can do something like this. You say, well, I want to add this item to the order with this ID, and you do that. And okay. of course, since you're separating everything, this method can't really return an order. So you kind of, that's another nice side benefit. It, like, you actually start to promote or force, if you will, uh, using more of an asynchronous style of design and program, which is also you know, pretty good for availability. So if we have also separated reading from writing, that means we could also use authorization rules. Yeah, those this, things right? become so much easier because you can focus. If I'm updating stuff, I can just focus on authorizing users or system doing that. I don't have to worry about anything else. Um, the opposite when I'm on the read side. So it becomes less complex and less possible to do screw-ups in, in the uh, authorization parts. But dude, what about performance? OK. <laughs> well, it actually. I would say it actually boosts performance. Again, we're, since on the read side, mm -hmm. so for example, if you have a read-intensive uh, application, you, it's immutable. You don't have to worry about thread safety anymore. You don't have to lock, so that gives it a boost in terms of performance. So read and write operations don't compete anymore. I mean, no. that's what you're saying, right? So you can, st you can start optimizing the read and write size, also on the infrastructure if you want to, but that's below our code. So it, it can actually improve the performance. Okay. And uh, I guess applications with like 95% reads and 5% writes, they can benefit from this. But complexity, then, I mean, doesn't this become more complex to do? Yeah, we touched on that topic uh, a couple of slides ago, uh -huh. where since you're applying some kind of separation of concern here, your code becomes less complex, right? Okay. When I'm on the read side, I only write code that has to do with read. Okay. And when I'm on the write side, I only write code that has to do with that. So your code becomes less cl clutter. Also, it becomes easier to test, usually. But it reduces the complexity. So if we go back to the original question of availability, how would you say entity snapshots now are you know, fixing or addressing that problem? Well, it promotes availability by having immutable objects. OK. Right? It promotes availability by, uh, by just by separating the read and write side, okay. where you don't have to worry about uh, concurrency and so on. And it's also uh, maybe not so much availability, but the integrity part is actually mm -hmm. important, because once you have an entity snapshot, that entity snapshot will always be valid, right? Because it's immutable. So it actually becomes easier to maintain the integrity part. And I guess write operations can become much, much more efficient if you use the single writer pattern that Martin Thompson talks about yeah. all the time. So you open up all these uh, yeah. possibilities. All right, interesting, very interesting. So, I guess entity snapshots, they can you know, really boost things in your, in your application and simplify things merely by separating these two, two domains, so to say, right? Yeah. Interesting. And we also get the, the benefits from domain primitives suddenly. It suddenly becomes a very powerful domain primitive. Okay, good. So what we have covered so far now is that we have seen a pattern, of course, where we can apply a domain primitive to prevent certain injection attacks. That's pretty cool. We can also use a pattern to simulate the mutability part by making it immutable. And that's the entity snapshots. And we get availability as a huge benefit suddenly again. Even though we were not thinking about availability, right? We were thinking about simplicity here of, you know, I just want to deal with my, my immutable object. That's much, much nicer. OK. So what about this, you know, accidental leakage of sensitive data? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very common to see systems where you, act by accident, are leaking data somewhere into log files or whatever and without knowing it, right? <clears throat> so common sources for this is, you know, log files e either through exception, exception stack traces or you just simply log an entire object without thinking about it. Not because you're evil, but just you're not thinking about it. You're not aware of it. Sometimes in web applications, typical, you put something in the session and it ends up being sensitive at some point of time and it can end up maybe in logs 
uh, or on disk if you serialize the session down to disk. I mean, is anyone using Tomcat? How many are using Tomcat? Okay, all, we had all, a fun experience yeah. once on a project when we used to work together. Uh, we used Tomcat, we put something in the session, and um, it, it wasn't sensitive, but at a later point in time it became sensitive. Then the application started to blow up for reasons you will see soon. And it turns out this this little feature turned on by default. If you shut down Tomcat, it's going to try to write down the session on disk by default. How many of you have disabled that feature? How many of you have encrypted your, your disks? Because now it's sensitive. Oh, see, that's one. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> carry on. Carry All right, on. carry on. <laughs> So, so, but the, the, the one thing that's very interesting is usually it's caused by having your domain model evolve over time. Mm -hmm. That's worth talking a little bit more about. So let's say you have a user in your system, mm -hmm. and currently it's just a name, a nickname, an age, and for your system, you decide that this is not sensitive, all right? So we're not talking GDPR here, right? Where this would probably be pretty sensitive. Yeah, in yeah. some systems you could say that these are sensitive, but you decide it's not sensitive, so we can do whatever we want with them. Great. We code our system, it's done. But then, I don't know, six months later, some business over, uh, product owner comes over and says, you know, we need to add something to the user. We need to add a social security number. Okay, okay. And suddenly your user contains sensitive data because the social security number in this case is considered to be sensitive. So what the problem is there, you're probably not gonna think about, or even if you think about it, you're not gonna have time to go through your entire code base that you've written before to see, did I use the user in, in any improper way? So there could be cases where in a one module, it's been by requirement, you say, we're gonna log every message that gets to this module. For example. For example, suddenly, you know, the user data is part of a message which is fine, it's supposed to be that way. It gets sent to this module, according to our requirements, we log it. Yeah. Or maybe we're gonna put the user in the Tomcat session because it's safe, but now it's actually sensitive. And gets down on disk. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's pretty bad. Okay, so wouldn't it be great if we had a design pattern that could help us detect these type of problems? Maybe not prevent them, but at least detect them very fast. You know what? Yeah. There is one. Oh, goodness. <laughs> We call it the read once object. You could call it read n if you want to, uh, n as in any number. So basically, if we have a sensitive value, we could write it like this and say that this object, the value of this object can only be read once by regular code. If you try to read it again, you're going to get an exception. And then we also added a little bit of sugar. You know, if you try to serialize it, it's gonna blow up. We didn't put the value in the toasting method and so on. But the, the essence is you can only consume it once because we realized in our system that you're only supposed to consume it once, not twice, once. But the important essence here is that you're supposed to analyze your domain, your context where you're where you're using this sensitive data and I guess map every place that you're supposed to consume it. Let's, let's say it's three times. Maybe it's not a password, it could be some other data, right? And now you know it's only going to get consumed three times. What happens if it's consumed the fourth time? Well, then somewhere it's going to blow up. If you're lucky and you're good, you have a good test suite or a good you know, uh, system test, you're going to notice it before it goes on to production. If it doesn't, well, it's just going to break in production, and then you'll notice by then, or your customer will notice. So the point is, you're going to notice that you're accidentally leaking this data somewhere. And you can also ensure that nobody else is evolving their model, their logic, to suddenly do things that are not allowed. Yeah. So in the, in the user example and the Tomcat story, we had an object similar to this, and that's how we actually uh, <laughs> discovered that the session was being written to disk, and we didn't want that. Uh, we, we sounded really smart that we know how Tomcat works, but no. It was an accident. It was an accident. It's like yeah, scientist course, works, yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah. The purpose of this pattern is to, again, not to prevent, if you can, if you can access the byte code, you, byte code, you can read this value as much as you want. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, but the thing is, most of the times we're doing mistakes yeah. as developers. We're just writing code trying to be good, and for some reason we didn't know, or, for, or maybe you have some library that just sucks the stuff out of this and try to serialize it to JSON or something. 
And that's by accident. So now we can detect it early and fix the problem or stop that from happening before it becomes a real security issue. All right. So now you've seen it all. Um, you've seen a way for us to detect things from leaking out into logs, maybe being stored on disk or sent over the network. Yeah. And that's really cool. Even though you weren't thinking about, you know, you were thinking about how can I deal with my sensitive data rather than all those other things. Okay. So, so to recap, yes. we talked about domain primitives today, which is basically a fundamental building block that you can use to build the rest of your code on. If you start putting in these little building blocks, you're going to notice that your code becomes so much easier to work with. At least that's our experience. And what they do in terms of security is that they will reduce the attack vector. Okay, not only will it promote you know, good design in your software, but it will also reduce the attack vector. And then to the snapshots, that's a really powerful way for you to simplify your, your code into, I have all my write operations here, all my read operations over there. I can have you know, different authorization rules here. But mostly, you can get availability because those entity snapshots behave like domain primitives, and they can scale very easily. And from a, just from a code design point of view, it's, it's a way to represent something that is mutable by concept as an immutable object in code, which makes life easier for us developers. And of course, you have now learned a pattern called read once or read n times uh, to help you detect things that are not supposed to leak out in, in logs or whatever. Um, and I think everyone here has figured it out by now. There is a book. Yes. This is our shameless plug. Yeah. Sorry. It's, it's not finished yet. Yes. But if you're interested in taking part of the early access program, where it's basically we're writing chapter and releasing them as we write almost, if you like this kind of stuff, you can actually buy it already, and then you'll get the real book later. And you can actually give us feedback in our process and go like, yeah, I don't, this does not make sense, or I do not agree, or this is brilliant. I hope that's the last thing you say. Mm -hmm. um, and to do that, you can actually use this you know, discount code, so you get 40% discount. That's pretty good. Um, don't buy minus one books, though. Yeah, don't try that one. <laughs> we should <laughs> test that before You we don't get that. rich writing books. <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you that. Um, all right, I think we have a, for a few more minutes for some Q&A. Yeah. Any questions? Oh, okay. so many questions. Do we have a uh, mic? Let's start with that one over there. Yeah, when we talk about empty snapshots, uh, you run any risk of getting a stale object? Uh, how do we deal with that? So the question was, if we're dealing with entity snapshots, the risk of getting a stale object. Yeah, so I guess uh, you want to think in terms of uh, eventual consistency, I guess. So, so, so I mean, it's the, the concept is, is um, if it's hard to grasp, it, you can think of it like if I'm going to a website, I get data and I see it in my browser, but by the time I'm reading the article, you know, that stuff could have changed on the server side. So, so no, I, I cannot, I'm not, it's not atomic, so I don't know if someone changed it. Even if I do like some kind of push magic, it's still just snapshot coming. So that, that's the metaphor I like to think you know, about when I'm explaining this stuff. But, so, but, so yeah, it can change, but then if you want to do operations on it, when you go to the read side, maybe you're not, you're not going to be able to do that operation because the state has changed, so now it's not valid operation, if that makes sense. Yeah, but I mean, like, in, in more exotics, you could say that the, the order is sent to shipping, uh, but then it's updated so it's cancelled, but the shipping part still thinks this is a valid order, and so it's shipping. Uh, so the... the, the uh, question again was then, what is, happens if that order uh, that we saw earlier here in the example, it gets sent to shipping, so it's going to get shipped, but then it's going to get cancelled later on. Okay, first of all, we have to assume that it's allowed to cancel a order that's about to get shipped. So let's assume that's actually a domain rule that's allowed. If that's the case, the same kind of rules apply in normal business. If you order something over the phone maybe, and then you realize, wait a minute, I don't want these shoes. <laughs> uh, you call them again and say, hey, please cancel my order. And they would go like, oh, all right. And maybe they can you know, revoke that package or what they can do, or you have to resend it back and stuff like that. So it would be the same kind of rules. And they, they, you, you start getting into thinking in terms of, you know, I have invariants that should be valid eventually. 
like you have all these states, and then you can get into design patterns like sagas, for example. Yes. You can look into that. It's very interesting. Uh, we, we try to figure out how do we solve these problems. Uh, I have this requirement, but it's not going to be valid until all the steps are done, for example. So that, that would be a design pattern that you can look into if you want to find out, you know, eventually you're not supposed to cancel the order. And so on. All right, I think there was a question up there somewhere. There you go. So the question is that uh, in the example we saw with the phone number and cross-site scripting, it was really easy to add uh, specific uh, regular expression checks. What if we have data that's not supposed to be, uh, that's not so easily checked? Is that good? Okay, good. So like a name, for instance, or an address. Or a message to the customer service. For yes, that, that could be. Yeah. Um, so I guess what would, the, the basic idea that we try to do, I mean, this is a back and forth dialogue with the, with the business side and the developer, and you're trying to figure out what's actually valid in the business domain. And sometimes you have to work, figure that out together because they haven't, the business side hasn't thought about this in, in these details. But there's always some limits. So maybe sometimes you're not going to get this perfect definition that is really tight, but at least maybe it's something better than just a string. So for example, I mean, if I can get, if I have a message they're supposed to send, if you say they can't be more than 2,000 characters, then that's a lot better than just a string. So you try to reduce as much as you can, and if the domain can't specify it so it's completely 100% 100 defined, then you, you can't really do anything about it, but at least you reduce the attack vector. But, but maybe you should also consider that data as sensitive, or actually dangerous data, right? Because it's so uh, special in, 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 in kind. Uh, so uh, by doing that, by applying actually the sensitive, or sorry, the read once pattern, or that symbol, you can actually prevent it from leaking out in places where you're not supposed to be, at least. So you yeah. have con full control of it. Yes. So the, the uh, follow-up question was, like, what if we would leak back the uh, same data to the user? That would be a cross-site scripting uh, attack vector, at least. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, remember, security in depth. Uh, we should still escape our stuff. That's supposed to be there. The same thing goes with, you know, if you had a SQL injection. Uh, that's why we use prepared statements at the very bottom, right? So if we can't apply specific domain rules to our you know, input data and, and model it as such, uh, and it has to be really, really loose, well, then we have to rely on some other security <coughs> layer, right? And, and that's the thing. Yeah. And in terms of user interfaces, it also, you know, the, the issue with uh, usability comes up. So if I'm filling out a form and everything is invalid, am I supposed to get back a blank form <laughs> because we didn't want to... You know, then you want to have a better user experience, so then maybe you decide, well, we're actually going to send back the input but we just have to deal with it and try to be really good at uh, escaping and so on. So there's always, always a balance between usability and how much security you want. Maybe one last question. Up there. Up there. So the question is, what, what if I can't predict how many times a value is going to get consumed? That's a problem. Yeah, <laughs> if, it's, if it's impossible, I guess the, the read once object or read and object is, is uh, kind of difficult to use. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think personally we usually use this on uh, data that is that we think are really sensitive, like passwords maybe, um, because it, there is an overhead. You have to do a lot of more work. So I don't think we've used this on on every single object in in a domain. So yeah, if you're if you're completely unaware of how often it's used, then I, I guess you can't use this. But, but you're in really deep trouble then, also. <laughs> because what if that leaks out at places that you're not controlling? Yeah. And that could be really serious. So, so if we want to get a little bit uh, dry and start talking about like stuff like GDPR, well, it says you need to know where your data is. So if your business says, well, we don't know where it is, or where it's used, then, well, then you have other issues than just your code. So I don't know if that didn't ask your question, <laughs> but it was just. Uh, 
restating but, your problem. Yeah, it, 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 it is a tough problem if you don't yeah. know how, how often it's going to be consumed. All right, I think we just reached the end of time. So thank you so much. Thank you.